Portobello and its haunted neighbours. Bearing the title of Edinburgh's seaside, Portobello sits on the outskirts of the city. Although historically it was a town, it is officially a residential suburb of Edinburgh. The area was initially known as Figgate Muir, an expanse of moorland through which the Figgate Burn flowed to the sea, with a broad sandy beach situated on the Forth estuary. By the 18th century, the area had become a haunt of seamen and smugglers. A cottage was built in 1742 on the High Street by a seaman called George Hamilton, who had served under Admiral Edward Vernon to capture Porto Bello in Panama. In 1739, he named the cottage Portobello Hut in honour of the victory. By 1753, there were other houses around it. The cabin remained intact until 1851, when it became a hostelry for travellers known as the Shepherd's Ha. Local legend tells of the skeletons of pirates buried beneath the sands leading from Seafield to neighbouring Joppa. Tales abound of pre-Bolshevik Russian sailors departing off the ships, ascending lampposts and drinking the oil, indeed a sight to behold. In later times the area, a thriving coastal seaside town, would play host to visitors' hordes. Travellers would flock to the marine gardens and observe the exotic sights of ornamental gardens with a Hampton Court inspired maze roller skating rink and the bizarre human zoo. A Somali tribe of 70 inhabitants would entertain thrill-seekers with mock fights and reenactments. Of the many tales of Portobello and its neighbours, there are many. Today we look at a selection of stories. Stories that will chill you to the bone. Abercorn Park sits on the border of Portobello and Joppa. Locals of the area refer to the attractive piece of green space as the boundary in Daisy Park. Popular with dog walkers and residents seeking a place to rest, Abercorn Park stands as a favoured location and much loved by its residents. On the adjacent side of the park sits a substantial water fountain. The grey in colour structure dominates the park's upper side and sits splendidly in the fading afternoon light. On the rear of the fountain is the face of a man. The imposing figure rests proudly upon the brass feature and on the opposite side displays his tribute. This fountain has been erected in remembrance of Dr Hugh Dewar. Portobello, by his grateful patients and numerous friends, who lament the loss in the prime of manhood of a kind friend and skilful and beloved physician. His quiet charity was known to the needy, 1866-1914. On the morning of Wednesday the 4th of February 1914, Dr Hugh Dewar visited a young woman in need of his urgent help. 25-year-old Jane Anderson, a resident of Portobello and in the late stages of pregnancy, contacted the doctor to help deliver her child that day. In the third stage of labour, while trying to remove the placenta and umbilical cord, Dr Dewar noticed a tube which he proceeded to pull. He had removed the four metre mucous membrane lining of the large intestine. Jane died in agony on that cold February morning. Quite how a medically qualified person could make such an appalling mistake is utterly incomprehensible, but it happened. Dr Dewar was never brought to justice. On the day before his trial for culpable homicide, he took his own life, most likely with narcotics. 
In July 1914, the Dewar Memorial Committee told the Edinburgh Council they had raised funds for a memorial. The board agreed on the condition it could approve the design and would not incur any expense. The fountain erected and sits before you today. The tragic story of malpractice and death to a vulnerable young woman, although a long time ago, has never been forgotten. Just half a mile away, in Portobello Cemetery, there is a less ornate headstone which commemorates Jane Anderson, who died in childbirth at the age of 25. It would appear that Jane's death never achieved justice even from beyond the grave. A lavish fountain in a popular park and a tragic victim's headstone lying only a short distance away. A mysterious twist would follow. Each year, on the 8th of March, International Women's Day, an echo of that tragic morning appears close to the fountain. A series of small objects placed in the ground surrounding the monument materialise without trace. Written upon the small placards is merely three short words that read as follows. Where's Jane's Fountain? Sitting proudly upon the beach esplanade is an attractive local property. Portobello Tower, also known as the Castle, sits at the end of Figgett Street and connects to adjacent Beach Lane. The tower, constructed in 1785 by James Cunningham. The structure, built from stones, windowsills and lintels from properties knocked down, allowed the South Bridge in Edinburgh to complete. With the remnants from Edinburgh Old Town transported to Portobello, the result, a culmination of Edinburgh's ancient past. According to sources, the tower originally built as a summer house for the lawyer John Cunningham. By 1864, it was much neglected and was then bought by Mr Hugh Payton, who restored it and built the adjacent house. It is now also incorporated in an amusement arcade. A giant sundial graced the front of the property for much of its existence. The structure transported to nearby Brighton Park, where it has remained for many years. The iconic tower is a much-loved piece of local Portobello history. Tales of the location and its impressive, imposing towers still abound today. Tales of the supernatural. I spoke with a woman who grew up in the area and asked about her memories of Portobello Tower. A pupil of nearby Tower Bank School, she recollects stories of ghostly figures walking inside the tower who would appear after dark. In her opinion, merely a cautionary tale to warn children to be home before dark. Her opinion would however drastically change. One night in 1978, she returned from a night on the beach with friends. She departed from the company at the beginning of Beach Lane. Although dark and streets now quiet, she walked merrily home. From the corner of her eye, she noticed movement from a window above her in the tower. For a reason unknown, she paused and gazed towards the turreted opening. Suddenly, the sight of a face staring back at her caused the startled girl to scream loud and flee in terror. She recalls. It was a long time ago and I was quite young at the time, 12 I think. Whatever it was staring back at me appeared menacing, dark and menacing. Whenever I walk along that area with my dog, I'm always slightly hesitant to look up at the tower after what I saw that night. Almost 10 years later, in 1987, two friends met with a strange incident in the confines of the tower. Ronnie would visit his friend Tam, a resident of a property in Beach Lane. The boys would spend hours in whatever pocket money available on the digital delights of tower amusements. 
The arcade, situated at the base of Portobello Tower, leads directly into the grounds from the rear. Ronnie waited for a while to acquire his turn on a popular game of the day. With the current operator defeated, Ronnie took his place at the helm of the game's console. Soon after commencing play, he was alerted to somebody standing behind him. He thought it might be Tam. He briefly looked across and saw his friend engrossed in a game of pinball. Turning around sharply, he was shocked to see that nobody was present. He played the game for the following ten minutes, the whole time aware of somebody standing behind him, each time turning to see and presented with space. After concluding his game, he asked his friend about the incident. Was anybody in his vicinity while playing? There was absolutely nobody to see. The arcade had been surprisingly quiet that day, except for the employee in the change booth and an older woman playing the slots they had the arcade section to themselves. Ronnie laughed to himself upon concluding his ghostly arcade encounter. He informed me that the game he played that day was a popular release titled in a strange coincidence, Ghosts and Goblins. Prestonfield House, situated in the Prestonfield area of Edinburgh, sits proudly beneath the imposing shadow of Arthur's seat. Known initially as Priestfield, the site was once a wealthy monastery founded in 1150 by Henry Errol of Northumbria. The ground purchased by James Dick and constructed in 1510 by Walter Chapman. In 1681, Priestfield House was burned to the ground and left in cinders after mass rioting by anti-Catholic protesters. Rebuilt by Sir William Bruce and renamed Prestonfield House to distance itself from any previous connections with Catholicism. The house remained the home of the Dick Baronets for many centuries. In 1751, the house was inherited by Sir Alexander Dick from his elder brother William and his wife Anne Dick. The Dick family continued modifying and improving the estate, adding paintings and new staircase with reception rooms. Peacocks roam freely within the grounds of the property, while livestock grazes in nearby fields. The Preston Field Estate can only describe as a glorious spectacle to see. The building, preserved in time, exists as a hotel today. Many visitors have enjoyed its charming atmosphere. Some have even met its ghosts. Reports exist of a phantom horse and carriage seen travelling up the drive and into Prestonfield House. Visitors claim to have witnessed the ghostly apparition in the small hours of the morning. One guest from America eager to see the spectral carriage, waited in anticipation one night. Feeling slightly disappointed after an uneventful evening, was shocked the following morning. A groundskeeper pointed out the marks of carriage wheels upon the ground where they stood, their room situated at the opposite side of the building. Three ghostly figures exist on the grounds of the property and sighted over the years. A man and a woman thought to be of the 18th century and a girl dressed in blue. Historians have considered the man to be James Boswell who visited the area and adored its grounds. The identity of the ghostly lady remains a mystery. Her costume and appearance are that of an 18th century visitor or resident. As for the child, dressed in green, nothing is known. In his book, Nights in Haunted Houses, esteemed ghost hunter and president of the famous ghost club, Peter Underwood, recalls his trip to Prestonfield House. I do not consider myself especially psychic or susceptible to the atmosphere, but I have to admit that I felt the old stairway at Prestonfield to be distinctly haunted. 
my accompaniment, Debbie too, found this area of the lovely house somewhat disturbing. Since we were not there for the specific purpose of exploring any ghostly activity, the fact that we both experienced sights and sounds that we could not explain cannot but be interesting. During the night, Debbie found herself awake several times, and she heard footsteps outside a room and the sound of whispering. While these sounds may have, of course, have had perfectly normal explanations, on the last occasion, she looked at her watch and she found that it was just 3 a.m. Hotel staff told her that she must have been dreaming for everyone in the place had retired before midnight. In any case, her room was situated so that only a person occupying that particular room could see into the passage outside. The staff was adamant that no one was, in fact, in the corridor at the time that Debbie heard the sounds. I slept well and without being disturbed at Prestonfield, but in the morning I glimpsed someone ahead of me on the steps as I went downstairs. It was only a glimpse, a quick impression of a large, elderly man, but then nothing. I was surprised to find no one of that description when I descended the stairs, or at breakfast, and it was certainly none of the staff. Prestonfield House had a grace and a charm all its own. With its fitting background of peaceful rolling acres and its ghosts, which are gentle shades of its past. Imagine, if you will, a warm summer Friday evening in 1977. The location is a property on the long stretching Joppa Road connecting Portobello and neighbouring Musselburgh. The house adjacent to the long established Ormoly Tavern is a mere stone's throw away. As the evening progressed and light would begin to fade, it was time for the children to return home. The two girls made their way along the long Joppa Road, guided by the lights leading to nearby Portobello. After viewing some Friday night television, the girls grew tired. The sound of the late night horror movie beginning would signal bedtime for the two girls. After a while, the children would settle down in the upstairs bedroom of the house they shared. With the distant sound of the television in the background, it did not take long for them to fall asleep. The eldest of the two girls, named Lisa, recalls being disturbed by the sight of movement by the bedroom door and the sound of footsteps. Presuming it to be her mum going to bed, she turned over and went back to sleep. Sometime later, she startled again this time hearing her parents pass her door and turn the lights off as they walked. With the sound of the television now absent and silent throughout the Joppa Road property, Lisa eventually fell back to sleep. Lisa and her sister leapt from their beds and into the darkness of the room. Both girls were screaming and in a blind panic at what they had both just witnessed seconds before. Fumbling through the pitch black room, the elder girl managed to source the light switch. The room, now illuminated, revealed her terrified sibling, now huddled beneath her bedsheets, petrified in the corner of the room. The commotion and screams from the girls alerted their parents, who rushed through to the children's bedroom. What the hell is the matter? cried the startled man. Both girls, sobbing and unable to reply, ran to the arms of their parents, where they remained for several minutes. After a while, the children both regained composure and eventually found the capacity to recall the disturbance. The sound of a metallic voice, similar to a radio or even a transistor, blasted into Lisa's sleeping ear. The loud sound lasted mere seconds. Lisa recalled that the terrifying sound resembled the word bar. In a terrifying coincidence, her still trembling sister confirmed that it was the same word she had heard also spoken into her ear at loud volume. 
the children's parents put the events down to mass hysteria and possibly the sound of downstairs Friday night horror movie. Lisa, however, disagrees and still does today. Lisa is still adamant today about the paranormal events of that evening. For years, she has attempted to trace any connection between the property on Joppa Road and any possibly strange occurrences. With records dating back to the 1800s, her research has led her to discover details on many previous property owners. To this day, she continues to attempt to discover the identity of the thing that went bump in the night. Carberry Tower sits two and a half miles southeast of Musselburgh. The picturesque square tower dates to the 11th century. In 1567, Mary Queen of Scots reportedly faced capture in the premises of Carberry Tower, resulting in her imprisonment and trial by the hands of opposing parties. A monument, the Queen's Mount, still stands nearby commemorating the incident. As well as her monument, there are tales of a woman in white, possibly Mary. Visitors and staff supposedly saw her in the vicinity of Carberry Tower. The apparition sighted on occasion gliding graciously across the courtyard. Another ghostly figure, considered to be that of a child, has appeared also. Legend tells of a youngster drowned tragically in the nearby pond. The small crying figure witness weeping in the dead of night by visitors to the castle. The New Hales estate sits located on the outskirts of Musselburgh. The house was initially built in 1686 on the Whitehill estate by Scottish architect James Smith. Its grand Palladian design sits imposingly amongst its many acres of grounds. Featured in the vicinity are stable blocks a bizarre shell grotto and a mid-18th century Rococo landscape garden. The estate has seen many owners in its history and a catalogue of fascinating, macabre and tragic tales. After ownership by Scottish nobleman John Bellenden, the estate sold in 1709 to Sir David Dalrymple and his wife Janet Rockheed. The Dalrymple family would accommodate New Hales until 2011. Sir David's older brother, John Dalrymple, is associated with one of the darkest chapters in Scotland's history. The killing of 38 members of the Macdonald clan by government troops, orchestrated by Dalrymple, is one of the darkest episodes in the turbulent history of the Highlands. Dalrymple's family crest is said to resemble the Nine of Diamonds playing card, with the card sometimes called the Curse of Scotland. His role in the Glencoe Massacre helped forge this bitter association. Situated alongside New Hales House exists an extensive and foreboding dark service tunnel, the long underpass previously used by servants of the building. The location is reportedly the site of a gruesome killing many years ago by a butler. The chilling title of the Murder Tunnel has been used by locals ever since. The sound of the victim's agonising cries rumoured to be heard by those brave enough to travel its long and dark expanse. Pinky House is a historic building built around a three-storey tower house located in Musselburgh. The house is said to be haunted by a green lady, a green jean. Some have identified the ghost as the bogle of Lilius Drummond who died at Dalgetty in 1601 and was the wife of Alexander Seaton. The ghost's appearance bodes ill for the resident family and sometimes accompanied by a child. Another identification has been suggested as a Lady Jane or Jean Seaton, possibly the daughter of George, 3rd Earl of Winton, who died unwed in 1636 and is said to have murdered her child. A 
portrait in the house shows the lady clad in a green dress and with a child. There are, however, many green jeans in Scotland's castles. Green Lady Ghost called Jean so that the name may be misleading. Another tale is that an underground passage connected the house with Falside Castle, which also features terrifying supernatural stories. <laughs> Brunston Farm and its mansion remains occupied from medieval times and sometimes referred to as Gilberston. During the Reformation, the Crichton family's house was infamous for conspiring against Cardinal Beaton. In 1545, both George Wishart and John Knox stayed at the location. Landowners built the current house in 1639 for John Maitland, first Duke of Lauderdale incorporating an L-plan house dating from the 1560s and early 14th century elements created for the Crichton family. It was extended by Sir William Bruce in 1672 and bought by Andrew Fletcher, Lord Milton, in 1733. The house had a fascinating sales history, changing hands many times, but some of its residents, it seems, have never gone away. In October of 1981, a teenager from the area and a pupil of Portobello High School met with a frightening experience. The boy visited the grounds of Brunston House one day as opposed to attending school. He spent the day exploring the many outhouses of the mansion, deserted and in a state of decay. In the early afternoon, a dog walker witnessed the youth fleeing from Brunston House's grounds at speed. The boy had a look upon his face of sheer terror. The passerby recognised the boy and it did not take long for word of the odd incident to reach his family. Back at school, fellow pupils who had heard about the absent boy's departure from the Gilberston property asked him what happened that day. The teenager at first dismissed the incident and claimed it to be a misunderstanding. After a while, he would confide in a female friend. He relayed the events of what happened that day in October. After spending the morning exploring the area, the boy claimed that he spent the next hour sitting in the farmhouse's downstairs outbuilding. Soon afterwards, he claims to have been alerted to the sound of something from above where he sat. The sound of slow shuffling on the floor above startled him at first. Presuming it possibly a fellow truant, he called out, but there was no reply. The quiet sound of movement continued, and the young man arose to investigate. He continued calling out as he approached the opposite side of the building eventually reaching a rickety wooden staircase. As he slowly climbed the creaking wooden steps, the shuffling sound grew more apparent. He ascended the steps and the darkness of the upstairs section of the building became apparent. He recalls fumbling for his box of matches and eventually managing to find them. What a match. Illuminating the ample attic space in which he stood, he could now see what created the slow shuffling sound. He would not repeat what he saw. His final word on the matter was that he would never return to the area of Brunston House ever again. He never did. In 2012, Staff from a security firm patrolling the vicinity of Brunston met with a strange encounter. It was out by the old deserted farmhouses and adjacent to the old piggery. He would park the vehicle and do a check of the area, ensuring it's safe and secure. Once satisfied, he would return to the car and complete relevant paperwork. From the corner of his eye, he noticed movement behind him in the rearview mirror. The sight of possibly two figures moving in the dark behind the car caused him to get out and look with his torch. 
It was 2 a.m. and nobody should have been in the vicinity. After a check of the abandoned piggery and buildings, he departed, satisfied that nobody was there. For the next few months, the same staff member would see movement by the piggery whenever he should visit, each time resulting in nobody being there at all. My name is Kerry. I moved to the vicinity of Brunston Farm in the early 1990s. My friends and I played within the old farm's many decrepit buildings, including the piggery and the surrounding fields. We spent hours and hours exploring. Being young, we thought a lot of what we saw and heard were part of our imaginations, or each other playing tricks. But as we got older and continued to experience very odd instances, it became clear that we were not the only ones within this abandoned farm. We used to hang about the old farm buildings. One of the main ones was called the Piggery, where the pigs had been reared and then slaughtered. By the time we came round, it had been long abandoned. Slates from the roof had started to fall in, equipment was everywhere. You know, it had been vandalised. But at night time, due to the fact it was nowhere near any street lights and had no lights from the houses, we decided to dare each other to run down from one door to the other. We try not stopping and try not getting freaked out. And when it came to my turn, I always freaked out. I would get halfway and then I would feel like I needed my back against a wall. A very urgent need to not have anything behind me. What I could feel was a presence, a kind of manifestation behind me. There was no space between me and it. And it felt heavy and horrible and just unsafe. It felt like it wanted to hurt me. It felt like it wanted to push me over or grab me or do something to me. So I would always get halfway and then bolt back. I would never stop. The guys found this funny, used to push me in and try keeping me inside until we started seeing figures at the other end. The other doorway was about three or four foot in the air, so no one could walk past it. But we would see people on that level outside walking right past the door. We knew there was no one there, and we couldn't figure out how people, unless they were about eight foot tall, could actually be seen that clearly. The other parts of the farm were right next to it, and a lot of the walls had started to fall in so you could see through. And some of the windows, the glass was gone, but you could see through it. We started seeing figures going past there. We'd kind of run round to see if it was someone following us, or if it was maybe someone homeless sleeping there, and we'd find nothing. But you'd hear it, you'd hear, like, slates getting stood on but there was no one there and there was no space that anyone could run away that quickly without us hearing the footsteps but we kept seeing these figures just at the corner of your eye one of the instances that comes to my mind is when i was young my friends and i would dare each other to run up the driveway of brunston manor we wanted to see who could get the furthest to it getting caught and when we discovered there was beehives well we couldn't resist having a look and trying to get there one of us would keep watch to make sure we weren't going to get caught, while the other two to three of us would run through and then push one over and run away again laughing. While we were doing this, we started to notice there was an old woman staring at us from the top middle window. She looked like a very strict old-fashioned grandmother, hair tied back in a bun, dark clothing, old-fashioned apron, a long, thin face. Her expression, anger pure anger that we were there. But she never banged on the window, never shouted at us, never came out the door. So we kind of started ignoring her, but we were always aware that she was watching. One time, when we were waiting outside the driveway for my other friends, my friend, we'll call him D, started screaming. I turned around to see what he was looking at, and we saw the old woman again at the window, but this time hovering in front of it. We could see the window through her. Again, the same look on her face. We could see the apron. She didn't really have a bottom half, but we could almost see the shape of a long skirt. We just both started screaming and ran away, terrified, promising we were not going to tell anyone what we saw in case we looked mental, in case we looked insane. Never spoke about it again. Years later, when I was sitting down with my parents and my brother and talking about what we'd seen, round about Brunston Manor in the piggery. My brother mentioned himself that he'd seen an old woman 
at the window, staring it outwards. It was the same window and the description sounds like the exact same woman. Neither of us know who she is, if she'd lived there before, if she was maybe one of the servants or one of the mistresses, but it, it just confined to me that what I saw was real. I saw an old woman floating outside a window that I could see through her. And it still gives me chills to this day thinking about it. One of the scariest things I saw was when I was 14 and a friend and I were walking over the Roman bridge to the fields to get to Joppa. The fields share a fence with the New Hills house estate. I would sometimes skip about there. On this day, walking through and the crops were not cut yet, we heard a rustling noise, turned round a bit worried that a dog was coming up behind us. Instead, this creature popped out. It was about two foot tall. It was red. It looked like it was made from leather. Its clothes was the same texture as its skin and it almost looked like it was part of it. It had no neck. It had these ginormous eyes and very skinny arms and legs. It looked a bit shocked to see us as well and we kind of stood staring at each other for a couple of seconds before it broke our gaze and jumped over the wall into the New Hills estate. My friend and I were terrified and ran away. We just ran away. We had no idea what we'd seen. The only word I can describe it is, is a troll. And I really believe that is what I saw that day was a troll. When I've asked my friend about this, he has shot the conversation down saying we saw nothing that day and will not even acknowledge it. This makes me wonder how terrified he was. But I do believe that day I saw a troll jumping into the Neil's estate. Whenever I'm there, I have tried looking for clues to see if I could find it again, but nothing. But I know what I saw and I can see it in my mind's eye. From the ruined pier at Seafield, across the Portobello sands, from the promenade and seafront, onto Joppa's old salt pans, in the grounds of Brunston Farm, to the walls of New Craig Hall. Tread careful on this haunted ground, beware ye one and all.